Welcome to the second presentation for AP. This is uh, 1.2. It says electrons and light. Prometheus, thief of light, giver of, uh, of light, bound by the gods, must have been a book. So it's a parallel between the Prometheus, the legend, and a book. Uh, the learning goals are that you understand the interaction between the electromagnetic spectrum and the atom, that you understand the information that can be obtained from the various types of spectroscopy, uh, that you distinguish between classical and quantum models of the atom. You should be familiar with that already. You should be able to assign quantum numbers and fill electron orbitals. You should have a general understanding of that, but maybe not quite to the level that we need. And you should be able to understand the relationship between electron configuration and physical and chemical properties. So the first thing that you should be familiar with, both from physics and from first year chemistry, is the fact that there is the electromagnetic spectrum. It consists of all frequencies of light, starting from radio and actually going all the way up to gamma. Okay, the speed of all electromagnetic radiation is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, sometimes commonly referred to as the speed of light, but it actually refers to the speed of all electromagnetic waves. So here you see that the electromagnetic spectrum consists of radio, micro, infrared, visible, UV, X, and gamma. Okay, those are the different divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum. The first one is radio. Radio t tend to be very low frequency, low energy, high wavelength. So the wa radio wavelengths tend to be very, very big. Okay, they don't have a high frequency. Uh, they are used primarily to transfer information between two things. So we think of radio signals. Microwaves are slightly higher in energy, slightly higher in frequency, slightly smaller in wavelength. So you see this is the general pattern. Cell phones and microwaves um, actually operate at microwave frequencies, which makes sense. That's why they're called microwaves. Next you have infrared. Once again, we have slightly higher energy than microwave, slightly higher frequency than microwave, and so on. Next we have visible light. Visible light is the only uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that you can see, and it's in the middle in terms of frequency, energy, and wavelength. Next we have ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is high frequency, high energy, low wavelength. One of the interesting things about ultraviolet is the first one that can actually really penetrate the skin and cause sunburn. It can be used to sterilize instruments because it actually causes cell mutation in, in different bacteria. Um, so it is actually the first one that really is dangerous. Next we come to x-rays. X-rays are higher frequency, high energy. They can actually penetrate uh, through all the layers of skin and actually not quite through the bones, but that's how you create an image of the bone. And then finally you have gamma rays. Gamma rays are the highest energy, highest frequency, lowest wavelength. So where we said radio was this, gamma is this. Okay, a whole bunch of waves in a, a very, very small segment. Okay, the only real use that we have for gamma rays is we do use it in radiation therapy to treat cancer. Now, you should be familiar with this equation already. This is the equation that governs all electromagnetic radi radiation. It says that C equals lambda V. Now, um, in the first year chemistry, we tend to refer to this as F for frequency. On the In AP, they tend to refer to it as V, and a lot of times it has like a little symbol over there. It's called a tilde, I think, that's over the V, and that actually represents the frequency. And it's just the difference between chemistry and physics. Physics will oftentimes call it F for frequency, whereas we, we call it a V. Okay, so you should be familiar with those variables, speed of light in a vacuum, wavelength, all those sorts of things. Next we say the sun emits all different forms of EM radiation towards Earth. Which segment of EM spectrum will reach Earth first? And if you were to look at this, uh, this is a common question. Um, a lot of times I gave it to a first year chemistry is the sun emits a gamma pulse. Can you have a satellite that warns and puts a shield around Earth in time? And the answer is no. All forms of the electromagnetic spectrum travel at the same speed, so it doesn't matter um, if you have radio signals or gamma rays, they all travel at the same 3 times 10 to the 8th. Next it says, what is the wavelength of red light in nanometers? And it gives you the equation 4 times 10 to the 14th. Okay, so the first thing you need to recognize is that we're talking about part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you have C equals lambda, I wrote it as F, should be really C equals lambda V. You have C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and you have V, which is 4 times 10 to the 14th, which is hertz. And this is an example of a calculation that could be done in the multiple choice part of the, of the uh, chemistry, AP chemistry exam. It's one that you don't actually require a calculator in order to do. And so let me kind of explain that. You're actually looking for the wavelength, and if you set this up, you would say that C equals lambda V, or 3 times 10 to the 8th equals 4 times 10 to the 14th, 
v, or excuse me, lambda. If you do that lambda at that point, you would take both sides and you would divide it by 4 times 10 to the 14th. When you do that, you cross this out and you end up with 7.5. The reason why it's 7.5 is 3 divided by 4 is 0.75. But we need to put it in scientific notation, so that's why I report it as 7.5. The next thing that you do is you're dividing these, so you actually subtract. So when you take 10 to the 8th divided by 10 to the 14th, you actually get 10 to the negative 6th. But remember, this was originally 0.75, so the fact that I moved it over 1, this needs to move over 1 as well, and you get 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. Now on the AP exam, there'll be multiple choice. And it'll be one of those things where you can quickly see that 3 divided by 4 is 7.5, and you would be able to eliminate all the ones that were 4 divided by 3 that were another numbers other than 7.5. So it's one of those things that's a trick that you can use. It's, it's a math problem, but you should be able to solve it without a calculator. So the question we need to ask ourselves is what is light? And the most common definition of light is that light is a wave. And there is some experimental evidence to back that up, and that's Young's experiment that provided evidence that light is a wave. Now one of the things that's really important in AP is you need to understand the experimental evidence, because a lot of times they will give you a question that gives you evidence and ask you what the result is. Well, it turns out when they put different they put a single light source, okay, this is a monochromatic light source, which means it's all yellow light, and they cut two slits in a piece of paper and they shone this light on the paper and they allowed the light to uh, interact. So you have a light source here and you have a light source here. Now you know it's identical light because it all came from the same light bulb. Well if you have these two sources right here, what you would expect to see if light was not a wave is you would expect to see bright and fading and bright and fading for t these two different slits, like a flashlight when you shot it on the wall. There's a bright spot and then there's fading spots. But the interesting they found, thing they found out was that when you did it, you actually got this, it's called an interference pattern. So you have a bright spot in the middle, and then you have a dark spot, and it's the dark spot that makes the difference. It's like, well, wait a sec, wait a second. How can I have a dark spot? And you say, well, the, it's where the light fades away. And that's true, but then you have another brighter spot on the other side. The only way that that could actually happen is if the light waves were interfering with each other. In this case, it would produce a bright spot. And the reason why it would produce a bright spot is if you have a peak and a peak overlap, those waves add together and get larger. And also, likewise, these dark spots are caused by the fact when you have a light wave overlap with a light wave, these two overlap and they cancel each other out. The absence of light produces the dark spot. So this is Young's experiment. It proved that, or gave evidence, it supported the idea that light was a wave. So light was generally considered a wave until the photoelectric effect experiment. Now this is an experiment that stumped scientists for a long time, and actually Albert Einstein in 1905, he was the one who actually explained this phenomenon. Um, in 1905, Albert Einstein wrote three papers. Um, they finished basically first, second, and third in the Nobel Prize competition. So what it is, is if you take a different, if you take a light, and you shine it on what's called a photo uh, a photo emissive surface. So in other words, if you take light and shine it on here, electrons can come out the other end. When electrons come out the other end, you can detect that current coming through the battery, and usually it hooks up to a light bulb or something along those lines. They didn't have light bulbs back then, but they had ways of measuring electrical current. The really interesting thing about this is if you use red light, nothing happens. But if you use violet light, then all of a sudden this thing lights up. And so that's really, really strange. You ask yourself, okay, well, how can that possibly be the case? And the answer is this. If, if light was a wave, these waves would just build up and build up and build up until an electron came off. But if you don't think of light as a wave, if you think of light as a particle, if a particle comes in and hits another particle, this particle is not going to move unless this one comes in and hits it hard enough. Think about if you play pool. If you hit the cue ball and you barely touch the cue ball, it's not going to make whatever ball this is, the eight ball, move. But if you hit this thing fast enough, with enough energy, with enough velocity, it is going to take this thing and knock it loose, and it can go around the rest of the circuit. So this gave evidence that light was a particle. So we have what we now is what we call wave-particle duality, that light has behaviors that are waves and light has behaviors that are particles. And scientists can use this wave-particle duality to kind of design experiments um, in such a way that would produce the most beneficial results for whatever they're trying to observe.
So what is electromagnetic radiation? Electromagnetic radiation, light, is produced from falling electrons. So what we have here is electrons can move up and down these orbitals. Now you learn that um, in first year chemistry. Whenever an electron moves up, it actually gains energy. Okay, it's called the excited state at that point. Uh, electrons generally don't like to be in the excited state, so what happens is those electrons fall back down. But in order for conservation of energy to be maintained, whenever this thing loses energy, energy has to be emitted, and it's emitted in the form of a photon of light, or you can think of it as a wave of light, however you want to think of it. Now what this means is that you can only have light or electromagnetic radiation produced when these two orbitals have a specific distance. So in other words, I can't produce light from here to here because the electron can't be here. It can't be there. So what this results in is every atom has a unique color pattern that's produced as a result of the distance between the orbitals. So this right here is Planck's equation, and it used this idea, the fact that the, the energy and the frequency of radiation, so once again, this should be V, okay, it just depends on the textbook really, but E equals HV should be the equation, and what you have is this is the energy, this is the same energy that we've talked about quite a bit, energy in joules, this H value is called Planck's constant, okay, and it is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. Okay, that is the value of Planck's constant. It is a constant, like the name implies, so it doesn't change values no matter what. And then finally you have the frequency, and the frequency we've talked about is the number of cycles per second. So now, what is the total energy of 1500 yellow photons uh, if the wavelength of the photons is 580 nanometers? So this is kind of a tricky question because really what I want to know is I want to know what the energy is. And this equation right here that I have is the energy of a single photon. This is saying if I have one photon, this is what it would be. So I need to do a couple of things to modify this equation to make it work for me. Now, if I have 10 photons, all with an energy of one joule, I could just take one and multiply it by 10, and I would have the, the amount of energy that's in 10 photons. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to modify this equation by putting an n there. The n just refers to the number of photons that are present. Now whenever I do that, I really want to put like a little subscript n right there. What that indicates is that it's the energy of a certain number of photons, not just the energy per photon. So now, I am trying to find the energy, and you can actually write it as energy 1500, that's what a lot of times what you'll see in a textbook, and that's what you're trying to solve for. Now another thing that you'll see is, although I do have Planck's constant, which is in fact a constant, um, I don't actually have the frequency. So this work allows you to, um, you have to use your prior knowledge that we learned in the previous equation, and you have to substitute in the equation C equals lambda V. Okay, so I don't have V. So what I can do is I can write an expression for V that is V equals C over lambda. And what I can do is I can then substitute that in there, and my equation now becomes E equals N H C over lambda. So there's a lot of algebra that's involved here, but it's the basic idea that I would solve for the frequency first, and then use the frequency to solve for the energy. So I do know Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. I do know that Planck's con or the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th. I also know that the n value in this particular problem is 1500, and that would allow me to, or in the wavelength, would be 580, but that's in nanometers, so I'd have to multiply it by 10 to the minus 9th because that's the conversion between nanometers and meters, and I know that's not in scientific notation now, um, but you can fix that whenever you put it in your calculator. So now at this point, you would plug it into the calculator. This is not a type of question you would see on the multiple choice part of an AP exam. It is not a calculation that is easy for you to solve or easy for you to manipulate or easy for you to simplify in your head. So at this point, you would use a calculator, you would go ahead and solve it, and you should be able to do that. Same thing here, we have how many red photons would it take to equal the energy of 10,000 violet photons? And so we have another situation in which we're trying to have the energies equal each other. So I want the energy of the red to equal the energy of the violet. And so what I'm going to do here is I've actually got it easy for the red photons. I can actually use the equation 
HV because I have the V. Uh, with the violet photons, it's a little bit more difficult because, um, and actually we have to solve for N right there, so N red. And this right here is going to be N purple. How many purple photons? And I can't use this HV again. I have to use the HC over lambda because I was given the wavelength. Now, one of the things that you can look at is there are some ways that you can simplify this before you actually get involved. You can actually cancel out Planck's constant because it's on both sides. So at this point, you would have the number of red photons is equal to 10,000, uh, and then you would have your C. Notice how I didn't put the H value in there. And then you would have to divide that by the lambda, which is going to be 430 times 10 to the minus 9th, and then you would also have to include the frequency of the red photons, which is 4 times 10 to the 14th. Now, this is one that could potentially be on an AP exam on the multiple choice. I don't think it would be. Um, and the reason why I don't think it would be is because of this 430. But if that was a whole number, like a 2 or something like that, you would see 3 divided by 4 and then 1, and you could simplify it. But this type of question will not be on the multiple choice portion of the exam. There are two types of spectrum that we need, or three types of spectrum we need to talk about. Uh, the first one is a continuous spectrum, and that is something where a light source produces all colors of light. Uh, an example of a continuous spectrum is the sun. The sun contains uh, many different elements that actually produce all of the colors of the rainbow. So you see a continuous spectrum there. Um, what you have here is called an emission spectrum. Whenever you take an atom and you excite the electrons to the next level, and then you allow them to fall back down, what happens is it produces a single color of light for this transition. There's a certain energy difference between those two. So whenever you produce that certain color of light, it shows up on what's called an emission spectrum. And that's the light that is produced as the electron falls from here to here. So if you see, the emission spectrum tells you how many orbitals or the orbital transition energy between the orbitals. Now if you look, the absorption spectrum is the exact same thing as the emission spectrum except this. What happens in an emission spectrum is you have this same element, but what you're doing is you're exposing this element to all frequencies of light. So you're taking this thing and you're shooting all the light you can at this atom. But what happens is the atom can only absorb energy that is equal to this transition level. So what happens is that energy of that frequency is absorbed and makes the electron go up to a higher level, so it produces a gap whenever you read the spectrum. So the emission spectrum and the absorption spectrum show the exact same information, just in a different way. You should be able to draw the emission spectrum given the absorption or absorption if you were given the emission. <clears throat> So here are some emission lines. So you see the emission lines for helium, hydrogen, mercury, neon, and sodium. So what you can do is you can actually use these emission lines to identify an unknown element if you were given the standards. So if I were to give you a standard set of emission lines like this and say, and then give you another spectra, you should be able to tell me which elements are present. In order for an element to be present, all of the spectral lines that are present in the spectrum must be present in the sample. So for example, if you had a spectra, if you had an unknown spectra that had this line and this line and this line, but not these two, it's not helium. It's got to be something else that has those same or similar lines. In order for that element to be present, all spectral lines must be present. So um, the Ryberg equation was actually used to explain the spectral lines of hydrogen. So there were several spectral lines of hydrogen, and what they did is they actually came up with a mathematical relationship. And all they did was they actually modeled it. They took the different information uh, where people had observed spectral lines, and they kept messing with the formula between the two until finally they came up with this value right here. So this equation right here represents the spectral lines of hydrogen for a very, very specific part of the spectrum. But they do not represent all the spectral lines of hydrogen. Instead, there are some of the spectral lines of hydrogen that are missing, and those were actually from the Balmer series and the Lyman series. Now, the reason why this doesn't represent all of the spectral lines is because of this. If you have a hydrogen, we generally only think of hydrogen as having an electron in the one orbital, and then if it gets to the excited state, the electron goes to the two orbital. But there are actually many, many more orbitals for hydrogen. In fact, there's an, inf an infinite number 
of, of orbitals. So what you have here is the first one is only representing transitions between the first and the second state. Really, everything to the ground state. So 2 to the ground state, 3 to the ground state, 4 to the ground state, infinity to the ground state. But the Balmer series and the Lyman series actually developed a second equation that's very similar and that will actually show the, the orbital transition to the second and to the third one. So 4 to 3, 5 to 3, or 4 to 2, 5 to 2. So realize that these spectral lines are produced by, by all of these potential electron orbitals. The Bohr model of the atom is the one that actually allows us to reference these spectral lines. Um, the Bohr model of the atom is the one that we say that electrons orbit the nucleus, that the electrons have to be at a specific distance, that distance is called an orbital, Absorbing energy makes the electrons move higher, emitting energy makes the electrons move lower. So just as kind of an extension, we talked about there being an infinite number of orbitals. Well, if you look here, <clears throat> as you go from 1, if this is the first orbital, 1 over 1 squared, that's 1, right? So if this term is 1, if this is infinity, well, does it, if you know that 1 over infinity simplifies to 0. So the absolute the absolute energy that you can get there is 1 minus 0 times this. Now if you exceed that value, if you are at an energy that is greater than the one that takes it to the infinite orbital, what you have is you are removing the electron and that's actually what we call ionization. Talked about the Bohr model. Um, this right here is the energy levels once again. It says light is created by electrons falling from orbits. And here you see the Lyman series are the transitions to the first orbital. You see the Balmer series, which are the transitions to the second orbital. <clears throat> so those are those series that you have here. Now these will actually simplify to this equation right here. Now this equation right here will actually tell you that the energy of a particular electron is related to H, which you know is the Planck's constant, C, which you know is the speed of light. This right here is called the Rydberg constant. And then this right here is the orbit, the orbital that you're looking at. Now all three of these constants are represented on your AP formula chart. So now we have to start example C1. We can start to look at the calculations for the formulas we just showed. It says, what is the energy of an electron in the third energy level? Actually, a better question for this is, what is the energy required to remove an electron from the third energy level because that's what we're doing when we're looking at these equations. So if you look right here we know that we have the third energy level and we know that we want to use the equation E equals minus HC RH divided by N squared. Now this is the equation for the energy required to remove an electron, hence the negative sign because you're actually pulling the electron away. Um, and what you have right here is this is the H value. It's the same H value we've been working with, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. This C value is the same C value we've been working with, 3 times 10 to the 8th. This RH value, the, the Rydberg constant for hydrogen, and really hydrogen is all we'll deal with right here, is 1.097 times 10 to the seventh, and you could look that up on your AP chart. So you're gonna take these numbers and you're gonna multiply all of them together, and then you're gonna divide by the n squared value. So in this case, our n value is going to be three, so three squared, which is nine. At this point, you would put it in a calculator, and you should be able to come up with a, a reasonable number. You should realize it's going to be a pretty small number. The reason why is you still have this 10 to the seventh and 10 to the eighth, those are large. But then whenever you take into account that negative 34, you're going to end up with a relatively small number. I believe it ends up being something like 2.43 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And you say, well, that's a really small amount of energy to, to ionize an atom. And you say, well, yes, but that's the amount of energy required to ionize a single atom. And we usually talk about moles of atoms. So that's actually quite a, uh, a lot of energy. The next one says, an electron transition from the fifth energy state in a Lyman series transition. What is the wavelength of the photon emitted? So this is one of those questions in which you're trying to find the wavelength. So we're going to have to use the 1 over lambda equals RH. And then we have 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared. 
Okay, because this is dealing with what's an electron transition. So the, the other formula we were using it was talking about an ionization. Now, actually, the, the two formulas tend to go hand in hand, but really what it is is whenever you ionize something, remember that's infinity, and that crosses out the zero. So that's why we separate the two formulas. One is the ionization formula, and this is the electron transition. And so at this point, we need to know that we need to transition it between two energy levels. Now, it is a fifth energy level, and then it's a Lyman series transition. So the fact that it's a Lyman tells me what the other energy level is. And if you remember your previous diagram, N is 1 in a Lyman transition. So we can show you right here. You have a Lyman series. Lyman series are always the ones that go to the first energy level. Okay, so then we can say, okay, if I have a Lyman series transition, that means I'm going to go 1 over 1 squared minus 1 over 5 squared. Okay, so 1 squared, 5 squared. And then you have to multiply it by the Rydberg constant, which is 1.097 times 10 to the seventh. Okay, once you've done that, you have that equals one over lambda. So in order to get the lambda value, you'll just go ahead and take the minus one of both sides and you'll get lambda is, and I'll leave that for you to solve. You should be able to solve that and tell me what it is in class when you get back. Next, we have the limitations of the Bohr model. We know that the Bohr model of the atom is not the greatest model of the atom. It works phenomenally well for hydrogen. And it does. But hydrogen is very unique in that it is a one electron atom. It's a one electron system. As soon as you add a second electron in here, so if you have one electron here, as soon as you add a second electron anywhere, the Bohr model fa falls apart. So it doesn't even work for helium, let alone uranium or anything like that. And the reason for that is the Bohr model, the atom, can explain the interaction between the two electrons. Now, the Bohr model is a phenomenally accurate model, but it's not perfect. So oftentimes what we do is we approximate things with the Bohr model of the atom to get very close, and then we have to use other models in order to get to a, a more accurate value. So the next most, so, so we have the energy state. The lower the energy state of an atom, the more stable an atom is. We've talked about that. So you should know the difference between an excited and a ground state. We can use the transition between the excited and the ground state to learn information about various molecules. And we're going to walk you back through the spectrum. Remember we talked about radio microinfrared earlier in this presentation? Now we're going to walk you through some of the ways chemists use the different parts of the spectrum. Now this is radio spectroscopy. So what that is doing is it's using radio waves that are very, very, very low energy to change the state of the nucleus. So you have an atom, let's say if we just make it hydrogen, if you have a lot of energy, the energy is absorbed by the electron and it bumps the electron up like we've talked about. But if you have a very, very low energy, it can actually excite the nucleus and it can actually cause the nucleus to align to a magnetic field, which is really kind of interesting. So if you use very, very, very low energy radio waves, you can excite the nucleus instead of the electrons and based on how the nucleus interacts with the magnetic field, you can figure out what the nucleus is. So this allows us to count the numbers and locations of the different types of atoms that are present. So here's an example of what you would see. This is what a radio spectroscopy um, printout looks like. Now you are not going to be expected to interpret this. It's not like I'm going to give you dots with these not here and say, okay, what is the molecule? That is an example of something that you can do in upper level university chemistry or maybe even graduate level chemistry at this point. But it, just know that because of the interaction between the radio waves and the nucleus, it allows us to identify atoms. Next we have microwave spectroscopy. Microwave spectroscopy, remember the microwaves are actually slightly higher in energy. So we're no longer looking at how the nucleus becomes excited, but now at this point we're looking at how the molecules rotate relative to one another. So for example, if I were to draw this molecule right here, Let's draw it. And let's make it a single button just to make it easier. So we have this right here. And you may know, you should know what this is called or what the name of this molecule is. Um, and let's, let's go ahead and make it like this. We'll make these chlorines. Okay, this is a derivative of ethane. It would be dichloroethane. But if you were to look at this, you can actually rotate molecules and you can see how they line up to see if the chlorines line up here, opposite of one another, 
or if they line up on the same side, which is called cis-trans isomerism, which you don't need to know about. But because microwave spectroscopies are slightly higher in energy, you can actually rotate the molecules into different states. And when you rotate them into different states, you can see what the energy difference is, and you can actually see what state the atom is most likely to be in. Once again, I'm not going to give you this and say, hey, what state is the molecule in? But you do need to know the interaction between the, the radiation and the ability to find some sort of information. Next, you have infrared spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy is very, very key in organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is generally the second chemistry, the second year of chemistry in a university. If you take the AP test and you test out of the first year of chemistry, it may be your first class at a university level. Now, infrared spectroscopy is a way of being able to, we're not talking about rotating bonds now. At this point, what we're talking about is vibrating the bonds back and forth. So if I have enough energy, remember, these, are really, these really represent electrons. So the electrons can move one way or they can move the other, like a spring. And so the spring goes back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, depending on what type of infrared um, waves that I put on the molecule. And so as a result of that, I can actually stretch the molecules out and I can produce what's called an infrared spectrum. Now the nice thing about an infrared spectrum is all the bonds in a molecule tend to be in the same place. So this right here is bromomethane. And so because it's bromomethane, each one of these peaks would represent a different part of bromomethane. It could be a carbon-hydrogen bond, okay? Or it could be a carbon-bromine bond. And what you would do is you would compare this infrared spectrum to a known series of spectrums and you would line them up and say, okay, that means these are the functional groups. By functional groups, they mean things that are attached to carbon. Okay, that's all organic chemistry is interested in. So once again, we have three things. We have excited the nucleus to kind of see what nucleuses are there and where they are. We've seen the three-dimensional structure and now we're already looking at the functional groups that are there. Generally speaking, UV invisible spectroscopy is used to sometimes to ionize, but generally it's used to figure out what the concentration of an unknown is. Now we will actually do this lab, so we're not going to go too much into it because we're going to do the Beer-Lambert law. But what this will allow you to do is figure out how much of a specific substance is in a solution. Okay, there is something called photoemission spectroscopy, and what it does is it uses high energy UV and X-rays to ionize an, an, an atom. So what they do is they say okay I have all these UV rays that I'm gonna send here's the spectrum I've sent all these UV rays at an atom what I get left is a hole right there so this must have been the energy that was required to ionize the atom and what this is is this represents what is also known as is we, we looked at this equation before when we looked at the photoelectric effect okay the energy that an ejected electron has is equal to HV, which you should know is the energy of a, of a wave, or the energy of this wavelength, and then this is the energy that it has. It's called the work constant. It's the amount of energy required to release the electron. De Broglie's dissertation. So, so far we've talked about electrons as being, or excuse me, light as being a wave or a particle. Well, de Broglie actually suggested in his doctoral dissertation that maybe electrons can be modeled as a wave, because so far electrons have been treated as particles. So what he did is he said, okay, well, I'm going I'm to pretend, just as kind of a thought experiment, that the electrons are actually going to be modeled as a wave. And if they're actually modeled as a wave, he related Planck's constant, and you should be familiar with this term from physics. This represents the momentum. If you haven't taken physics yet, that's okay. It's no big deal. But this is the momentum of a particle. It's the mass times the velocity. And those two are related to each other, give you the wavelength. So this will be the wavelength of an electron. And if you notice it, the wavelength of an electron determines on uh, the mass of an electron, which is constant, and then the velocity of an electron, which changes in its position related to the atom. So if you kind of extend this out. Well, let's look at an example first. What is the difference um, in wavelength for a 200, or excuse me, a 2,000 kilogram car traveling at 20 meters per second and an electron traveling at 70,000 meters per second? Now, if you were to look at this, it says we're trying to look at the difference in wavelength. Now, remember, wavelength is equal to h divided by mv. Well, for the first one, I'm looking at a car, which is 2,000 kilograms traveling at 20 meters per second. That one's pretty easy. I would get 
times 10 to the minus 34th. And the wavelength of this particular car ends up being fairly small because I'm taking Planck's constant and dividing it by 2,000 and multiplied by 20. So the total result would be 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th divided by 40,000. Really small number. Now when you look at it for an electron, it's quite a bit different because if you look at an electron, it's 6.626 times 10 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th divided by um, well, the velocity, which is much greater, 70,000. People say, oh well, that's an even bigger number. But when you look at the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31st, that is extremely small. It starts to get to the point where you are actually going to have a reasonable wavelength. This is going to be something like times 10 to the minus 40 or something like that. Okay, this is going to start to get into something like 10 to the minus 6th or 10 to the minus 7th, which is interesting because that's actually a wavelength that you can see. So you have to start to look at these sorts of things and say, well, there's no way you could ever see that and it's really small. What happened as a result of this, whenever de Broglie published this hypothesis, people extended it further. And one of those people, well, first they had to prove it. So they had to prove it, and this was a famous experiment that was done by Davison Germer. And it's another example of people being able to apply ideas and test them experimentally. So what they did is they actually came up with an electron source. And that's not hard, it's just like electricity going through a wire. So they had electrons, and what they did is they fired electrons at a nickel crystal. This is a crystal. And normally what you would expect to happen is you'd have a bright spot and then it would fade, just like a flashlight. So you would expect to see the same thing whenever you fired solid particles at it. Think of, think of it as Plinko balls or, or a ball trying to travel through there. But what they found out instead was there was the same interference pattern they saw with light. You had a bright spot and then it was dark. And then you had a bright spot and then it was dark. So what this showed is that electrons can interfere with one another. Now, one of the extensions of this, the fact that we can do this, allows for the creation of what we call electron microscopes. What this allows us to do is we can actually convert images and we can actually take electrons and the wavelength of electrons and we can actually convert them into visible light. What that allows us to do is that allows us to quote unquote see things that are much, much, much smaller than what is actually possible using visible light. So whenever you're shown a picture of DNA in a cell, that was obtained from an electron microscope because the DNA itself is so small that you'd never be able to see it using visible light. Okay, that's an example of what it is. Werner Heisenberg extended this idea of um, de Broglie, and what he came up with was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it came up with this idea that location and momentum cannot be simultaneously known. And the reason why he came up with this is if you take the whole idea of wavelength equals h divided by mv, well this right here remember is the momentum. Momentum is sometimes represented as p. So you have wavelength, you have h, and you have p. Well if you were to look at this, wavelength, whenever you have a wavelength, there is some uncertainty in exactly where the electron is if you think about it that way. If you think about the electron as a particle, is it here? Or is it here? Or is it here? Or is it here? There's some uncertainty in exactly the position of it based on the fact that it has a wavelength. Okay? So since you don't know exactly where it is, that uncertainty gives us what we call the uncertainty principle. Now, this uncertainty principle was mathematically proven to become out to be delta x equals delta, or excuse me, delta x times delta p is to, has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Now this h bar and this h are related. h is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th. h bar is equal to h over 2 pi. Now you say, well why would they do that? Why would they create a whole new variable and not just put h over 2 pi? The reason why it is this constant right here comes up so much in chemistry when you look at the atom that they decided to give it its own variable because it just comes up that often that it's better to go ahead and make it its own thing. So now we're going to calculate the minimum uncertainty in position of a proton with the uncertainty and velocity of 1 times 10 to the minus third.
So one of the things that we want to talk about is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle generally only applies to electrons and things that are smaller than electrons. And the reason why is you have delta x, delta p, greater than or equal to h bar over 2, which remember h bar over 2 is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th divided by, at this point, 4 pi. Okay, because this is h over 2 pi, got to add the other to it. This is such an incredibly small number that unless you have very, very, very small values, this will always hold true. If you think about a car, a car has a mass of 2,000 kilograms and a, a velocity of sometimes 20 meters per second. You have 40,000, so you would take this number and divide it by 40,000, and that'd be uncertainty in position. It's, it's basically zero. So if we plug in an electron, now remember this delta P represents the momentum. So you would say delta X, and then you would say your uncertainty in position and your mass. So here's your mass, or your velocity. Your mass is a proton. You would look that up on the table. Has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. At this point, you would divide both sides by 1 times 10 to the minus 3rd and 1.672 times 10 to the minus 27th. Okay? At this point, you are starting to once again deal with relatively small numbers. I would have to multiply both sides and I would have to, count, excuse me, I'd have to divide both sides by that, and you end up getting a pretty small number. Okay, I'll let you do the math, kind of figure it out what it is, but it ends up being reasonably small. Okay, it's not within anything that's bigger than like 10 to the minus 10th. You have to start to deal with depending on your experiment. So it's one of those things where if you go any, if you go smaller than a proton, like an electron, this can actually be fairly significant. But once you're talking about protons and atoms, it tends to be to the point where it doesn't really matter. Erwin Schrödinger took the idea that came from um, de Broglie and he extended it even further. He took the idea, physics has had a fundamental wave equation for a long time. That was the, it was a mathematical equation that described the behavior of a wave. And what Schrödinger did is he actually took what we knew about the atom and plugged it in and got an equation for an atom. This right here represents the Schrödinger e equation for an atom you will not be responsible for anything to do with the Schrodinger model of the atom as far as math is concerned. You do need to know that it, this wave equation represents what's called the probability density. Okay, If you notice, this right here is what describes the atom, but it does not describe where an electron is. It describes the probability of it being in a certain location. That's why the Schrodinger model is often referred to as a quantum model of the atom, because it does not deal with an absolute position. Now, one of the interesting things about this is when you were to solve the 1s equation and the 2s equation and the 2p equation, these are the graphs that you would get for the probability density. So if you were to look right here, you get this peak right here, and there's your 2p, 3s, and so on. So you get these interesting patterns and it's kind of tough to deal with these patterns because it looks in one dimension. You're just trying to look at it. But if you tried to take this graph and you tried to rotate it in two and then three dimensions, you'd come up with some familiar shapes. That's this. If you were to take the 1s orbital and you were to apply it, this is the shape you would get. This is the shape that corresponds to the graph. And what we've talked about before in first year chemistry is that the s orbital is related to that shape. Whenever you take that, sh that same graph that we had for P, you would get that shape, which is the dumbbell shapes that we've talked about. So the, the probability densities, when you solve these Schrodinger equations, is the reason why we have these shapes of the orbitals. Okay, They're not just there because we think they're going to be that shape, it's actually solving the math out and this is the probability function. Now remember, that whenever we talk about these shapes, the light part of the shape represents where the electron is 90% of the time. Okay, so that's a really key thing too. The electron could be somewhere else, but 90% of the time it's in that shape. So now we come to the idea of principal quantum numbers. Okay, 
there are four sets of quantum or four quantum numbers that define every electron in an atom. The first one is called the principal quantum number and it's called n. What that refers to is that refers to the energy level of the electron. So they're they're labeled as KLM NOP. We generally don't look at them as KLM NOP. What we usually look at is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8. What that means, these directly correspond to the periods on the periodic table. So you have a periodic table that looks like something like this. I'm doing a pretty poor job drawing it. But you have hydrogen and helium and then everything else below it. So you have periods. Everything in the first period has a principal quantum number of 1. Everything in the second one has a principal quantum number of 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and so on. So its position on the periodic table as far as the, the um, rows, that determines the principal quantum number. Whenever you increase the quantum number, you're increasing the size of the orbital because you're extending it away from the n nucleus. And that makes sense because that should make sense with what we've covered before. The second number that we're talking about is the quantum number L. Okay, So we've already defined n, and we said n could be 1, 2, 3, so on and so on and so on. The principal number quantum L depends on the principal, on the, the excuse me, the quantum number L depends on the principal quantum number n. So if n is 1, there is only one possible value of L. L must equal 0. Okay? Because L is determined by the equation n minus 1. So if n is 2, L can be 0 or 1. If n is 3, then L can be 0, 1, or 2. Now the interesting thing about this quantum number is this quantum number, often referred to as the angular momentum quantum number, that's not important, determines the shape of the orbital. If you have n is equal to 1 and l is equal to 0, the 0 says that I have an s orbital. And an s orbital is that one right there. Next, if you have n is equal to 2, L could be 0, which means there could be an s orbital, or L could be 1, which would mean that there's a p orbital. And if you were to look at the next, we have the magnetic quantum number. The magnetic quantum number is called ML. So that's what we have here. And what it does is it actually describes the subshell or the arm that you're talking about for a particular orbital. So the ML value has these potential values. So for example, if L is 0, the only possible value of ML is 0. But if L is 1, the possible values would be negative 1, 0, and 1. And if L is 2, the possible values of ML would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. So they represent the subshells or the arms of a particular orbital. So if you were to take a look at these, it makes sense that if you have an L shape of 0, remember, so if you have an L of 0, the shape is an S orbital. An S orbital is a sphere. The sphere has no arms or subshells or anything like that. But if you were to look at L equals 1, L equals 1 is a P shape. The P shape, we said, is a series of dumbbells. You have a dumbbell here. You have a dumbbell here, and it's hard to draw, but you have one coming into and out of the page. It's a three-dimensional structure. So you have three sets of dumbbells. So the ML1 actually determines the electron's orbital subshell. Now, there is no difference between minus 1, 0, and 1. Okay? There's no difference in energy. What we tend to say, though, is there's x, y, and z. Okay? So we would say px, py, pz. We can't do that with D because D actually has five orbital shells and there's not like an X, Y, Z, A, B dimensions. So we would say D negative 2, D negative 1, D 0, D 1, D 2, and then you can do the same thing with F. So the interesting thing about these magnetic subshells is each one of them can hold two electrons. So if, and we're going to get into that in just a second, but if you were to look at it, since this one has no subshells, the s orbital can only hold two electrons. 
but this one has three orbitals, or three suborbitals. So because of that, each one of them can hold two. You have two plus two plus two, means that the p orbital can hold six electrons, which is exactly what you learned in the first year of chemistry. The d orbital has five. Five times two would be ten. And then the f orbital has seven. The f orbital has seven, then you would multiply it by two, it's fourteen. Okay. You have the s orbital right here. It has a maximum of two electrons. It is a spherical shape, and remember, it's a 90% probability of finding the electron in that shape, and it represents the first two columns on the periodic table. So when you have this, it's the first two columns of the periodic table represent the s orbital. Next, you have the p orbital. It starts at the second energy level. So when you have that first row that has hydrogen and helium, you'll notice that there is no p orbital. Okay. No p orbital is possible in the first energy level, but it does start in the second one. In the second one, there's a maximum of six electrons. You can have two in px, two in py, two in pz, once again, 90%, and it is group 13 through 18 on the periodic table. So if you were to look at the periodic table, you've got these two columns, and then it gets a little bit bigger over here. Okay, well, there's no, something like that. These six elements right here, these six columns, represent the p orbital shapes. Next, you have the octet rule. Generally speaking, electrons like to have eight valence electrons, electrons in the outer level. That means they have a full S and a full P orbital. Now, that's for elements 1 through 36, which tend to kind of get you to right there. When you start to get into these bigger electrons, that kind of falls apart, but we're not going to do that in this class. So for the most part, we like to say that something is stable if it has full S and full P valence orbitals. So now we have the D orbital. The d orbital starts on the third energy level, even though it looks like it's the fourth one on the periodic table, it's the third energy level. It can hold a maximum of 10 electrons. It's got this d0, d0, d1, all that kind of stuff, and it represents the transition metals on the periodic table. So when you have the periodic table, you've got your s, you've got your p, this middle section represents your d orbitals. Finally, you have your f orbital. It starts in the fourth energy level. It can hold a maximum of 14 electrons. And it is the anthonides and lactonides. See, the lanthanides and actinides. Said that wrong. Okay, so you have these right here. You've got your S, you've got your P, you've got your D. The ones that are pulled out are the F orbitals. So the electrons spin in quantum numbers. Electrons themselves spin. Okay, they are charged. They're like the Earth, though, in the fact that they rotate themselves. Okay, so they can spin either way, clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, that generally is referred to S or MS. Okay, it's seen both ways in books, but it's called the spin of an electron. Now, there are two possible values. We assign them as the plus one half and the minus one half. And it actually doesn't matter. They don't say things like, oh, if it's spinning clockwise, it's plus one half, and counterclockwise, it's minus one half. It just makes no difference. We're just distinguishing between the two. The way that they figured this out, though, is if you have a magnetic field, one of the electrons will be attracted kind of towards the top and the other one will be repelled towards the bottom based on the fact that they're spinning because a spinning electron is actually itself a magnet so when you put a magnet in a magnetic field well if you put two north magnets together they repel they push away and if you put a north and a south together they attract now the Pauli exclusion principle that we have is something that's based on all the quantum numbers. What it says is that no two electrons can have the same quantum number in an atom. So they have to have an energy level. We say one, two, three, four, five. They have to have a different, they can have the same L value, they can have the same ML value, but all four of the numbers, the combination of the four numbers has to be unique for every single electron. And what that shows us right here is that this is not correct. The reason why this would not be correct is this is a 2s2. So the energy level would be 2. The angular quantum number, since it's an s orbital, would be 0. The magnetic quantum number would be 0 because there are no subshells. And then the spin, as shown here, is both plus 1 half. That right there is a violation of the Pauli exclusion principle. So because two atoms in the same, or excuse me, two electrons in the same atom have the same principal quantum numbers. Now there is a reason for this. It is not just because somebody said so. The reason why is when you have these two electrons that are spinning in the same direction, that means that they are both north magnets.
and two north magnets have a slight repulsion. Electrons themselves like to repel. So because of that, an atom will be never, never be stable if the electrons are in the same state. But if you were to replace this one with a minus one half, that's now a south magnet. Even though the two electrons want to repel each other because they're both negatively charged, there is an attraction between the two because they have different magnets. And so because of that, that's enough to overcome the repulsion and allow them to exist in the same orbital. So there's a reason behind the Pauli exclusion principle that you should be familiar with. Next, we have the quantum number in the periodic table. We've already talked about this, 1s1, 2s2. It's, it gets to be fairly easy where I can say, what's the quantum number of this one? Or what's the highest quantum number of this one? And you should be able to say, oh, it's in the fifth orbital, it's p, and then it is this. You should be able to do that fairly easily. Off-ball principles and degenerate energy levels. So, electrons are filled from the lowest possible energy state. So if a particular atom has seven electrons, okay, it wants to take the lowest possible state. So it will take and put two electrons here. Okay, notice how I drew one up and one down because you can't have them both going up. Okay, then it puts two here. And then it gets to the point where there are three electrons left and there are three spaces. Okay, some people will do this and that would be incorrect. Some people will do this and that would be okay. Some people will do this and that would be okay. These are arrows, they're usually drawn as little half arrows. But the whole point of this is that the electrons will fill the lowest energy state first. You would never see an electron, or excuse me, an atom, in which the electrons go here and here, and then here, 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 and they don't fill up the lowest energy level. Okay, they will always fill up the lowest energy level because remember, electrons are negative. The nucleus is positive. So they want to come as close to each other as possible. It's the lowest possible energy state. Oh, and this right here is a little diagram that tells you what the energy states are going to be. So you just write the S column, the P column, the D column, the F column, and then you come diagonal. So 1S would go first, then 2S, then 2P, then 3S, then 3P, then 4S, then 3D. So notice how 3D is even after 4S. So this is how you would fill it, figure out the energy levels between the two. Another thing that you should notice is, as far as the energy differences between the two, if you notice, there's quite a wide gap between 1 and 2, but as you go to 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, the energy differences get much, much smaller. The Zeeman effect is the experimental evidence that we had in order to figure out what the magnetic quantum numbers were, the fact that there are orbitals. Uh, what they did is if you take a spectrum line, okay, so in other words, they have sodium, and sodium produces this spectrum line they take that same sodium, that same canister of gas, and they apply an external magnetic field to it. That's what this north and south is. It's a magnet. Well, when they apply a magnet to it, it splits up into three separate lines. And so the question is, is what's going on there? Well, the answer is there are three different orbitals. You have this one, this one, and you have this one. One of these things is lining up, one of these orbitals is lining up with the magnetic field, making it more likely that it's an energetic line. So it shifts this line over just a little bit. The other one directly opposes the magnetic field. Okay, and I'm just picking them at random. This one opposes the magnetic field. And so it actually changes its energy to here. This one is perpendicular to the magnetic field, so it has no effect at all and just stays where it is. So the Zeeman effect was actually the experimental evidence that we had these suborbitals. And you see that here. Not all electrons of the same orbital are equal electrons, there must be suborbitals. Now, just so you know, if there is no external magnetic field, these, the energy level of all the p electrons are the same. Okay, now, if you put it in a magnetic field, now there are very, 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 very small differences. I mean, these are extremely small differences in energy. And it does not determine which one is X, which one is Y, and which one is Z, because if I change where my magnet is, it just 
you'll have three different energy levels. Hund's rule. Hund's rule is the is the idea that like charges repel, and so the electrons want to be as far away from each other as possible. Because of Hund's rule, you will fill one electron in the px, one in the py, and one in the pz before adding a second orb electron in each orbital. Now notice that doesn't apply to the 2s orbital. Okay, so what happens in the 2s orbital is you fill it first, and then you when the electrons, whenever the suborbitals have the same amount of energy, you fill them one at a time. But the difference is on the energy diagram, you have two s's here and two p is here. So see how these are on the same level and this one is below it. So you would fill s and then you would fill p. Now this is particularly important when we talk about carbon. Carbon is oftentimes drawn like this. That's the Lewis dot structure of carbon that most people are familiar with. But if you were to do it in actuality, one of these represents the S, and then the other three, the P. Well, if you were to follow the energy level diagram, it would look something like this. So actually, the correct annotation for carbon would be two in the S orbital, and then one in each of the P orbitals. Now, carbon can easily obtain energy to kick one, one of these electrons up to here. That's why carbon has the ability to form four bonds, is because it can easily jump this gap. But in actuality, carbon should be two and then one. Representing atoms, you should be familiar with the idea of electron configuration from first year chemistry. You should be able to take this right here and say it's hydrogen, or it's the electron structure of hydrogen, or taking this and tell me it's fluorine. This right here represents the energy level. This is the number of electrons in each orbital. So as an example, you can also do shortcuts. Shortcuts are going to make a lot of sense, especially whenever you have very, very large atoms. So you see this is the electron structure of potassium. But this right here represents a noble gas. You can only do it for noble gases. You can't do things like, oh, silver plus, you can't do that. But if you have a noble gas, that represents a complete orbital or valence structure. So in other words, the electrons are full up to that point. So then you can just say, okay, it's just like argon plus one extra electron. Okay, but once again, you can only do that with the noble gases like helium, neon, argon, xenon, krypton, those sorts of things. So here's an example. You have an atom with 34 protons. Okay, 34 protons tells me exactly what the element is going to be. And you should be able to tell me that the element is from your periodic table. Um, you see right here that it's going to be a, maybe a different um, electron structure based on the fact that we have multiple electrons. So if you were to count the number of electrons, we have 2, 4, uh, 10, 12, 18, 28, 30, 36. So we have 36 electrons. Whenever you have a difference in the number of protons and the number of electrons, you know you have to write it as an ion. The fact that there are two more electrons than there are protons tells me that it is going to be 2 minus. Okay? So you'd have to take a look at your periodic table, and you have to say, okay, what's the element that has 34 uh, protons? You would write it right there. You'd have the charge of 2 minus. Say, what is the element that is predicted by the electron structure? And then it says, note, it is kind of tricky. Okay, so this is, a, this is an interesting one because of this right here. The first thing that you want to do is you want to write it in a standard notation. So if you write it in a standard notation, it will be much, much easier for you in terms of trying to figure out exactly what it is. So the first thing we can do is we can say, where is the last time that I have a complete orbital structure? And that would be right here, this 5p6. Okay, if you were to take a look at the 5p6 on your periodic table, it would be much easier for you to identify exactly which element we're talking about here. Well, if you were to do that, let's pull up our periodic ta table real quick. Um, you could say it is, I think it's xenon, right? I don't have my periodic table with me. I think it's xenon, but check that. Then the last thing you have is you have this 4F1, 5D1, 6S2. So what that means is you have to add one element from the d orbital, 
which we, which is there, then you have to one add one from the f orbital and the two from the 6s2 orbital. So at this point, it looks like this element would be not thorium, but um, selenium. It's a tough one. It says not everything follows the rule. So you have AR 4s1 3d10 rather than the expected. AR4S2 3D9. Um, we are you are not expected to know exceptions to the rule. Okay, there are exceptions. Just realize that there are. So if I give you a question that says this is the electron structure, it's an exception to the rule. Just be prepared for that. Okay, you don't you don't have to know them. Just kind of think about why it may happen. Okay. Electron configuration in the periodic table, there are similars, uh, similarities in chemical properties because of the similarity in valence structure. So if you look at the halogens, they all have this structure right here. 2p5, 3p5, 4p5, and so they have similar reactivity because of that. Okay, so alkali metals always end in an S1, and they're highly reactive because they want to get rid of one electron. Alkaline earth metals always end in S2, and they are generally reactive, but less reactive than alkali metals. Okay, the chalcogens, which are sometimes just called group 16, always end in S2P4. Okay, they're generally reactive, and they generally like to take electrons. The halogens are always S2P5, so it could be, you know, 4S2, 4P5, and that's a halogen. And they are very, very reactive, and they really want to take electrons. And then... Finally, you also have the halogens, or excuse me, the noble gases, and the noble gases always end in S2P6.